So I don't really have much of a segue here. Uh, I'd like to go move into here as we're reaching our low early afternoon post-launch ebb and energy. Um, get you, all of you back involved, work with me, and, and, and try to bring out some of these lessons. We've kind of been, aside from questions, sort of talking at you for several hours, and you've been trying to assimilate you know, hopefully some new information, interesting information, into the concerns and sort of conceptual models for your system of interest that you've had already. And so I'm interested in finding out what, what has stuck, what has changed your mind about some things, and what has popped up for you. And I was going to have uh, Marcy or anyone come up and take be our, our recorder of record to kind of take some notes. Um, let me quickly open up a note-taking application. I'll let Eric do it. <laughs> so, I was just also going to say we're doing an interactive session. Everyone was given an evaluation. At the end today, we're going to do a drawing for hats for evaluations that were turned in. This is name optional. We would like to be possible recipient of winning a Mountain Studies Institute hat. Um, we're going to collect the uh, evaluation form a little bit later. And also someone asked me about that if he was interested in donating a little bit for lunch, where to do with that. And we have a beer stein um, on the back table there. Folks wanted to throw some cash on that. And again, thank you so much for sponsoring. It will not go towards beer. Truly, honest. So I, I was just wondering if anyone, if there's anyone who came in here with a specific concern that has been relieved hearing what we've been hearing. Anyone, anyone come in as a about either fire or runoff changes and, and has been relieved or, or at least changed and the perspective of that management concern has changed given what you have first today. the news you think it's going to be. Well, if that's not getting out to the public, will you help us get it there? Yes, everyone shake it. <laughs> if you are, if you'll interact with the public you help us get that out there. That, yeah, there are. If it's news landscape change, there are serious concerns and some impact that yet to be felt, but you know, a lot of the worst case things that people are feeling are imminent are not going to happen. Or even the long term changes. Will the forest come back? Yes, it will come back. Back. Um, anyone else with you know, concerns or concerns that haven't either haven't been addressed or you still have them because we haven't given you an answer or any answer? Well, so that was a comment concern and maybe you and other people could comment on it too. So, you know, when we're looking at the forest as a whole, maybe we're looking at that process and we don't have any concerns. But when we focus in on certain specific uses of the areas, for example, and some other areas where, uh, special areas, um, I think there is a concern. Yeah. And I think that if we were to think about some management activities that uh, we might undertake, we might be looking at some of the types of these areas that are in the NPSP area, heavy trail, there's a public safety, you know, there's, there's an impact on your visual quality, Works better if it's different, and for some people that's very dramatic. But I think that uh, there are some things in the areas where we get to do that. Sure. No, I think generally across the range of, of resource interests and risks um, associated with applying beetle infestation to this extent, that you know we look beyond the, the hydrology and the water quality and the, the water, the forest's watershed, and we think, wow, you know, potential much more. For serious impacts of recreation, not only for wildlife, certain species, um, and so it certainly needs more consideration. Hopefully, we can have if we can do them. We can help you know, future workshops like this to kind of bring some of those concerns out on the table. 
and address them. Um, as far as runoff, let's think about this, this runoff. Um, is anyone here, is there information that we've given that you would use now? We give you any, anything you can take home besides the questions that you have on the runoff? Well, I guess from a layperson's perspective, I would say the question of the high five area and the solitary area, I feel, as well as the fire that's I really hope that there's a lot of water left that can be intended for a lot more nitrogen. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a fire that you said, you know, that's uh, going to be built over the Yeah, with the fire, absolutely. And I know the USGS is, uh, I don't think they've got a depending on the sequester. Other things, but they've been really good with other front range buyers to getting us to go almost like rapid response to come in and, and work with the state and the community to get uh, monitoring put in for both putting in, you know, rapidly putting in the stream gauges to look at runoff and flash flooding risk and, and also water quality monitoring. And, and so, yeah, it is occurring. I think when we came out of the fourth field, the fourth field, the fourth field, the fourth field, the fourth the fire is not the big issue. That's the big publicity here. And as you mentioned, we've been in the center of the But of all the millions and millions of dollars that are going into the forest, most of it is for what is it say, team construction. And you've got still kind of outside at home. We haven't seen it here yet. But with some of the stuff on the street, it was one of the first questions we got in the question was for both of those. Mm -hmm. And now we may have very little steer uh, riding road time running right now. But who's very so close with all the dead snags that you can involve? It's not all the great things, but they're going to get a lot of time to come back. And it's not a one-time event. It's every year. It's every year. The same old trail. Um, I think a lot of people are going to find that a lot of ground that they were used to being able to walk through, bike through, bike horses through, um, it's, it's almost you know, impossible in 10 or 15 years to get through some of that. Mm -hmm. What that's going to do is concentrate even more human use on the trail and on those very designated jobs. And it's going to be much harder to like, get to go push back to the woods in 20 years. This is the end of the Right, right. And if somebody's not going to move that ground, they're going to want to spread the work out and enter the business in the place. Hit that point, right? Monsoon, Grand County, good events, you know, inch 
uh, and an hour here in the dorm. And, uh, yeah, they're not being affected worse than they were prior to the presentation. You know, could there be a threshold effect that, especially on steeper slopes, moving up to the canopy, at least in the forest, you know, the, the understory comes back in and sort of you know, at least shades the soil that you could get more erosion. Yeah, it's more likely to happen in those kinds of events. I mean, well, so, we, I don't think that's a bad one. No, I don't study at all, but um, uh, anecdotally, a lot of it is probably going to be somewhat more conjectures and so on. I think there's a lot of graphs that have shown multiple times. Uh, we did see a presentation by White River, and that's the part they all just showing uh, some very severe gullying uh, bailing out. But that was in an area where a lot of the next years were zero. So it's sort of that same thing. When you clear a lot of trees away, you may get to the next year. So we know probably that's a lot more new to respond to it. Yeah, no one's really actually looking at that part of the world. It just seems like a lot of the studies that came out of the Northwest back in the 80s were connecting, we were looking at um, clear cuts of the erosion, and they weren't showing a connection there except for erosion. Yeah, and more, the more serious disturbed soils you have, so with this kind of a situation, you're not going to have those disturbed soils. So I don't know, I don't know. Yeah, and then we're talking about areas of lost life. Thank you. 
the variability is, and then we could, we could grab the Durango at animate stage and, and see it. At least just to show the, the paired watershed concept, not that we would see a trend expected in anything yet. Emerging to variability. Let's put that in our list. Then, did you want to add to that, or you think that's a, a good idea? And you're going to do it when you get back to the office on Friday. Okay. Friday end of the day. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah, we got that. Just to note on that, Mountain Studies Institute has partnered with Colorado State University to hire an intern this summer to try and pull up repeat topography data sets that exist from the past and then to start working on that, um, you know, taking new data, repeating studies like, for instance, for rare plants, G1, G2, and then sort of building that repertoire. Um, and we'd like to establish some forest sites as well as part of that project. So if folks know of some good photo points, please contact me. Um, we'll do that this summer and hope to see that program expand. Is anybody looking at these things to affect water runoff and everything on a helicopter stand of dead birds? Is that too easy to Yeah. You know, that would be really interesting and, um, yeah, part of the control and sorts of treatments. But, um, you know, beetle kill, as Scott was trying to conjecture about, you know, beetle kill plus fire versus just a fire. It's in there already. Um, but, um, yeah, certainly, and as I said, once you have a fire, then you tend to get, you're able to marshal more resources, especially from USGS, has uh, you know, a bevy of researchers in Denver and Boulder, for example, in the California state, just focused on sort of fire changes to the surface and the stream. So that would be a good, good thing to do, then you get a fire uh, in your Stuff. Yeah. Oh, another thing I'm thinking about, because our area does not actually have a street park. Yeah, I think right now. Yeah, tell you about that area. Yeah. And I'm just wondering about you know, management options prior to that. Um, you know, it's a very tough to thing in the street park for the street park and various issues that go down. You could end up creating problems that didn't exist. Right. Um, but what other options are there out there that anybody know though that you can know, implement you know in a watershed to hopefully increase resilience and sustain the need. I mean we've got a fair, you know, five species composition. We sort of get up above ten thousand feet and we get up around spruce. But I'm just wondering on you know, because we're looking at the ski area that hasn't been impacted by the front range areas yet. We do have a fair bit of all right, who silviculturists want to drop a prescription in 30 seconds or less? <laughs> I can speak on behalf of what we've done in the creek ski area. We had in the early 2000s, we noticed it, and so we started doing a lot. We spent probably $100,000 to move the flood tree. And for a while, it was, you know, you look out from it, you see all the forest around, and it was, it was really, it was feeling like we were going to be able to control it. But then the population then shoots their point and there's nothing to do with it. Yeah, that's the worst <laughs> case scenario that I keep thinking. Yeah. Like, you fall as yeah. When, there's, when the beetle pressure is low enough, I mean, I can speak from my experience too, in the logical and sonical, that we had a more diverse site or, or forest on our land. And then uh, the previous owner did a lot of fire mitigation. They really opened it up, took out more lodge poles and anything else. And, um, and we experienced proportionately less chill in our lodge pole than even similar slopes just adjacent to us. But again, we never got to like the real epidemic levels that other parts of the um, pine beetle zone were seeing. I have no doubt that we had a little coming in the that pine, even did the nice spacing and diversity. And it's looking at like cast tank or pot. Right. That's what it all comes down to. Yeah. Whether that's homeowners or ski area owners. It's like, well, if I spend this money, is that really going to solve the problem? And I keep giving you the community. Yeah, Scott, did you? Well, I can, I can give you a general guideline. Is you're, when, like you said, when the beetle population reaches a certain level, there's not going to be much you can 
to, but in the long run planning of these forests, we need to manage for diversity of species, diversity of age classes, and size. And, and so if a certain genome comes in, it may take out all your large fruits, but still hopefully you've got a lot of young, healthy fruits that are going to survive it or maybe some sub outline fur. And the more you can continue that operation and maintain, get some of those. What, what do the beetles do? They release that understory. They just want to release the understory before the beetles get there. And, and those trees are going to be healthy and, and fast growing and create that leaf strip in the run so it will survive an attack. Theoretically, I mean, there's no guarantee. But the best you can do is, is operate on some principles of diversity. Yeah, should have been thinking of clear cut, 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 cut that you get you can establish. So that, you know, right now, everything is kind of that 80 to 125 year age box. We don't have a lot of diversity in that. The only areas we have a good region are on the sea paths, or where it all is happening. Then we're getting good solution. Is what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing I'm going to recommend is when it opens up those sea strips, you're going to need to fence them or something to keep people out to protect that country. And that's the ski area you want to ski with the They're not necessarily interested in You want to go to the tree. I know. One last on this, and I want to. I'm not going to go hard to the rest of you. Just aggregate the highlight tree. It's not going to. It's not even you know, for your entire ski area, but around certain bodies and whatnot, I know that the section of your highest value tree is with MTH or I don't know, Barbara, do you know? Does so anybody else know more about So we could say the package didn't work, but I could have said a magic incantation next to each tree. That's what I say that too. But I'll keep putting the packet up. When we start it, we cannot stop. <laughs> so I would have shift gears a bit and, and ask, you know, we presented a lot of research, a lot of research findings. Uh, most of it was from the live poll, right? No, no, a little bit from Spruce Fur. What of it did you glom onto and say, boy, I'd really like to know that? but for spruce beetle and spruce fir? Um, or what were some uncertainties that we kind of left hanging, left you hanging, and you're like, send some, find some graduate students, find someone to go back out and field from David out in yet another year, and let's we'll get some answers about that. Is there anything on the uh, runoff, anything at the process level? Um, what? I was just going to say runoff, yeah. Better install on the All right, we got to mobilize the hydraulic. And, and I would say that that's one thing you look at is the higher gear. How much is it taking into the soil to not transpire in it, for example, mm -hmm. and then eventually it comes out with all the Yeah. It'd be good to repeat, really kind of repeat all of the process level stuff in, in the spruce bird zone. And if, if what I'm telling you is true, if we get more proportionally uh, our, of our runoff from spruce fir than the live hole, it's you know, more important. If we invested all of this research capital, social capital, in the live hole zone, we can not find it, we should be doing it to spruce people. But at least to show that there's an increase in runoff our farmers can go up to the of trees. Oh, they'll, they'll, they'll start releasing spruce <laughs> <laughs>
it's hard to know if that research up there would apply here or not. Sure. Yep. Yeah. We've, we've been we've playing the stretching game all day here. And asking for this fit. We better have the site specific research on that thing. Or or even the best supposition. Yeah. long-term stewardship contract that has just been um, authorized on the, the GOSA district. 
Um, Kevin's group, Kevin and Scott, are going to be working toward um, monitoring and different mechanical treatments will be applied there as well as prescribed burn. And um, part of the San Juan Headwaters group's goal is to establish a monitoring program that will look at that. And some of those mechanical treatments, we've already done some soil compaction studies, and we're definitely very interested in changes in the under under and uh, understory related to that. And I think, Kevin, did you want to add? Go ahead. Okay. Look at this landscape a little bit farther. Very close to the environment. We talked about trees and flowers. Wildlife, food and are all part all part of the thing. You can simply can't manage this for trees and flowers and flowers. I completely agree. And we've kind of created an artificial boundary for the way we have, so it's not just a core shot, but how we've been arranging this particular research endeavor of what a lot of us kind of By focusing on certain things, you inevitably push other things to the margin that are hard, especially in a multi resource management environment to be linked. And it shouldn't be linked. So, part of it. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, you mentioned a couple of the the Yeah. I'm sure if there's enough detail about these the the surviving canopy tree that we have to get, advanced generation of these trees, the Yeah, you know, I, you know, I think it's, it's, it's obviously the sum, but, you know, which component is most important and which, you know, which species mixes, I mean, that, that is really something um, that deserves a little more attention um, in the other story. And that's kind of true across the history of forest research. It's in politicology, intellectual campus, you know, research, like that, so I have in a lot of cases, you know, so it's really important going on on the, on the media. Yeah. Well, one thing I really want to know about what would be the effect of selecting and the treatment program in the process? Would it be any different from the kind of work that you have any work that you have to do on the supply table that any of them is going to be the supply that you need to mark and be in the best of that? These have all been brought up in nature. Uh, so, what are your impacts on right. different right. eco-hydrologic functions within the riparian zone? Yeah. And start getting well, tree dying and not transpiring in the right in the, in the riparian zone, and then falling into the streams and becoming. Of course, what are you doing? Sure. Yeah, boy, that's a great question. That's kind of a hole in, in what we've been looking at. It, it's like carrying down the stream hydrology and college. So thanks for bringing that up. We, we can kind of marshal it. Yeah. Maybe this is one of the things we're trying to stay out of there. I, I was wondering about Brayden. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm staying out of that. I'm really connected. Yeah, certainly one of them. And would be beautiful areas to be better off to be more attractive uh, for Brayden. Not being a wildlife biologist, I would assume so. You know, opening up the canopy and, and releasing drugs and forks, that would be a better problem. Raising for ungulates and what's the management response to that? What's the other issues? Do you want to tackle that in 20 seconds? Or just leave that as an open question? That would be a great, I would do a workshop just on, on wildlife impact and um, also domestic animals. Thank you.